Hey everyone, I'm Mike Henry, and this is my Procreate 4.3 demo for the piece I call Missing Pieces. So this is a take on this Max Greca Draw This In Your Style piece that he did. Um, if you're not familiar with Draw This In Your Style, it's something that kind of started on Instagram where someone will post a drawing that has usually some sort of distinctive, interesting look, and then they ask everybody else to draw it the way they would draw it in their style. I absolutely love doing these, though I don't always have the time to. When I saw this piece, I thought it was so cool, I wanted to jump in. And uh, let's get going and talk about why I made the decisions that I made and why you could call this being in my style. I think that style is a very interesting topic and it can raise some really strong opinions, both on the side of wanting one versus you shouldn't work on your style or it'll happen naturally or definitely develop what you're looking for. And I think that there's a million different ways that, that can go. And I think that usually the different artists who give different answers around it are influenced by what they went through directly. Um, some people tried to cultivate a style and it didn't work. Uh, and so then they waited for it to happen naturally and then it did. So they're on the side of wait for it to happen naturally. I think there actually are some artists that really deliberately go for a certain look and feel and then what comes out the other end they're super happy with and that's what they then stick with for the rest of their career. To be perfectly honest, it's kind of harder to keep one style for a really, really long time uh, than it is to just kind of naturally move through a few different things. And really, I think what that comes down to is influence. You are influenced usually by different things uh, throughout your career. Early in your career, you may find some bit of animation or a video game or an old movie or something like that that you absolutely love, and it starts telling you subconsciously even, like, this is something you like, start working towards this. And even if you then continue to like that thing for a really long time, you start getting exposed to other things and you start saying, like, oh, now this is kind of cool, like, this is kind of affecting me as well. And I think that's absolutely natural. Uh, it can even happen just from, like, the people that you're around. Sometimes you may be around art that do something really cool. Nowadays, we have so many different sources by which we are inspired. It's all the classic forms of media and the people around us. It's also because of things like Instagram and Pinterest and all these things where people can share imagery really, really quickly. And now you can, of course, collect all of that into collections and refer back to it. And these are really the elements that impact your style the most. Now, underneath all of that style, you want to work really hard to have your fundamentals and to try and make sure you know what you're building when you're building these shapes. But then some of that interpretation of it gets layered on by all of these influences. Now we'll get back to influences in a second, but something I want to reference here is you could see there I was doing a really tight line. That's because at one point I thought it would be interesting to interpret this character with a line drawing with just flats. I thought that that might be fun to sort of almost take a little bit of that like a village corrupted vibe and bring it into this. I still think that that would be cool, but then in the moment I was like, you know what, I'm not really inspired by that right now, so that would just be kind of a lie. That would be me kind of forcing something. So instead let's just go in with the turpentine brush and start blocking stuff in because I've been really enjoying doing that and why not do it this is this is for fun this isn't for a client or something so why not do the thing that I'm most excited to be doing at that moment so what's gonna happen on screen right now you can see I've already got all these shapes laid in through the sketch and the sketch is already different than what Max did uh, it's in the same vein but it is more my proportions more my interpretations and so we start just using that rough sketch to build the flat that will become the basis of the whole piece. Now let me switch back to talking about inspiration because I think that that's a question lots of people have especially when you're trying to find yourself or find your style and it doesn't necessarily get answered all the time. So my influences are pretty wide-ranging I think most people's are, but I think that to try and really isolate it down, it's like when I was young, and by young I mean like first grade, I was influenced by all the super popular stuff of the time. I was influenced by the Ninja Turtles, and I was influenced by all these just really badass cartoons since that was a really strong time in pop culture for creating new IP. That's kind of what I did when I was young. I would create these 
little pitch packets, not really knowing that they were exactly pitch packets, but it was like a pack of characters and lore and uh, maybe like a, a fight scene or something like that because I was just trying to build out like a world and then I would move on to the next thing, which is funny because that's very much what I do professionally and I was I gravitated towards that when I was very very young and just kind of kept it going but as I grew older I really wanted to get into comic books comic books seemed like the number one thing that was going to satisfy me and that was because I really didn't know how animation or movies or video games worked uh, so I would start working towards building comics and I would draw comics all the time and this is probably from like let's say fourth grade through to like late high school or something like that I would draw comic book pages design characters first and foremost and then put them into comic book pages and so that meant my influences were in comic books a lot I mean I was certainly influenced still by cartoons uh, but comic books is what I was looking at and what I was digesting all the time and it was so much easier to say this art that I'm looking at was done by this person or these couple of people instead of it being this kind of faceless animation company because back then we didn't really have access to find out who all of these people were and what they were doing and also when you're young you're really ignorant to the process and how many people work on these things so it was more of a oh, I can actually read this comic book and I can see this artist's name and I can buy more comic books by this artist and directly digest this person's work. And so, of course, early on, my first few comic books were done by, like, Jim Lee, uh, which later transitioned into, like, Todd McFarlane. And then when artists like Joe Matarera and Umberto Ramos and... Um, uh, Chris Pachalo and stuff like that when they came onto the scene it started to feel like it was still comic book art but it was being influenced almost not by comic book art I, I don't want to pigeonhole comic book art but it really felt like in the 90s it was kind of like comic book art influenced by comic book art and then when a sort of new breed came onto the scene, it was like comic book art influenced by other forms of media. Now, I know that that's not entirely true. That It's not like Jim Lee was only looking at comic book art and producing comic books, but it, that's what it kind of felt like as a viewer. And so when that new breed came on, it was like, oh, this is something new, which then, of course, turned you to saying, like, well, what are they looking at that's making them draw like this, or what's influencing them? So then the next evolution was I had watched anime a ton when I was a kid, but it didn't really seep into my style until, let's say, middle school and then definitely high school. And so that started to influence me. That's definitely because of uh, just having access to anime as well as I was reading a ton of like Rumiko Takahashi uh, work. And then with Joe Mad being like that dude who, not certainly not the only one, but I think kind of like the most prominent guy who like came onto the scene and was like, yeah, this is totally influenced by that. And I love this stuff. And I think all of these things are really cool. So like go take a look at that stuff. And then that led to that sort of explosion of artists that were all kind of influenced by that era. I was certainly one of them. So I went to college uh, for a degree, an art degree that was really general. The specific uh, art degree was called Media Arts and Animation, which is kind of a catch-all for kind of everything. And the reason why I went in for that degree was because I really would love to go to school for comic books at the time. Uh, but I couldn't for various reasons. So it was like, okay, what's the closest thing? Okay, how about this thing here? Um, so I went for that. That ended up being a largely 3D focused curriculum. So even though I really wanted to be doing illustration or concept art or uh, comic books, animation is really the thing that I was exposed to the most, 3D animation. So when I was there, I graduated from that school with kind of the same thing everyone back then graduated from. It was like a demo reel that had some 2D animation, some 3D animation, some modeling, some 2D art, uh, and then of course a separate portfolio that had 2D art in it that was really kind of all around sort of I guess I would almost argue like illustrative world building. The purpose of it was world building, but it was basically illustrations. It wasn't really digging into the true purpose of concept art. And so when I came out of school, my first gig in the industry, uh, actually in a studio, was doing 3D animation. 
Now, I did not really, I do really enjoy the concept of animation. However, it wasn't really scratching the itch that I needed. And, and what I would sort of later find out was that my true calling was the world building and concept art sort of route. I, I love designing characters and and building like this this is why this world behaves this way this is the kind of story you can tell in this setting that to me was always way cooler so when you look at that where i ended up was actually a a mashing together of all the things that i liked the world building was all around just designing characters and designing worlds and the sort of like this is a great stage to tell a story we kind of came from the comic book stuff and even some of the animation stuff, me sort of just being really interested in things like the Ninja Turtles and all that stuff from when I was younger is what would determine some of my aesthetic later on. And so just to kind of back it up a little bit again, like the, in college then, because I was in 3D animation stuff, I was being way more exposed to Pixar and DreamWorks and meaning the work of those companies because that's what we were looking at all the time. When you're modeling a character, we were looking at the way it was modeled in Toy Story, when we were looking at how to light something. I mean, everything was being compared to that and like some ILM work and that kind of stuff. And so that's where I started to get a little bit influenced by that because there's a bit of this sort of survival nature of being a successful artist where you're kind of, you're always having to interpret pop culture and figure out where you fit within pop culture. There's absolutely room for you to come in and be this like outsider and present something that nobody's seen before, but having some degree of knowledge around that ecosystem is really important. And I think that part of that survivalist nature, when it's at its simplest form, is kind of like, what's going on out there right now? I'm going to do some stuff like that. And so that's what a lot of it was back then. It was like, okay, I'm going to design all these characters because I still have this weird perception that I could either work in Japan on an anime or work at Marvel on a comic book company and do comic books and all that kind of stuff. But then at the same time, it's like, but I need to make sure that I'm looking at the way these companies are doing it in animation because that's where everybody's going to or that's where this school is trying to take me or whatever it is. So when you're hearing me sort of ramble through my history and my history of influences, you can kind of see why I ended up where I am. One thing that I guess I, I left out of there too is that I am kind of a rabid pop culture fan and I would say that not so much in some of the really bigger stuff, but I'm a rabid pop culture fan and kind of like what you might call like tier two or tier three pop culture, which is why you hear me nonstop talking about how Giant Robo is the greatest thing ever created. Because I, it's, it's the same thing I do with kind of everything. I'm into, the, let's say, the second or third tier music and the second or third tier movies and games. And I'm usually not the person who's in love with the main thing. Not because I'm necessarily trying to be that like contrarian that's like, no, 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 the popular stuff sucks. Like I, I think the popular stuff is fine. It's just that it doesn't click with me like some of these other things do. And so that's why I think the greatest band of all time is MU330. I think the greatest anime of all time is Giant Robo. I think the best movie ever made is Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, like stuff like that. So if you take all of that and you take everything that I talked about with all those comic book influences and animation and all that, and you shove it all through a tube, the sort of uh, dough <laughs> that comes out the other side is essentially my art. I think that when you look at my art, there's parts of it that have anime vibes, there's parts of it that has animation vibes, concept art for sure, uh, but then there are other things that are a little bit comic booky, things that are kind of like American animation, and that to me, at the end of the day, is how you create a style that is satisfying because I think that anybody can replicate a style especially if you're just like directly referencing what somebody else is doing uh, but it's really you're trying to find the style that's going to kind of naturally come out of you so that you're never having to fake it and I don't mean fake it in a oh you asshole don't fake that art I mean for yourself like you don't want to get into a position where you're like oh I didn't draw the nose like the thing that I like that I'm trying to draw the nose like I think that it's totally fine to reference artists especially when you're trying to figure out like how did this person solve it and is there something there that I can learn uh, but I think that when if you're constantly in the trap of 
how did this person do it or how do these types of artists do it um you're always going to be in a position where you're you're just generating something that you like because someone else did it but it's not necessarily coming from you now if you do that and you love it and i'm wrong about you that's that's fine the most important thing about art is that it's it's satisfying to you and that it uh I mean, actually, that's probably just it. It's satisfying to you. And you we're all, we all do art to pay the bills sometimes, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm talking about like the art that you do for fun. I'm not talking about when you're forced to do some project just because it's it's part of the job. So really, at the end of the day, you just want to be happy with what you're doing, and I think that you also want it to be genuine to yourself, and I think that that's the way you get there. It's by t over the years just, just digesting and digesting and digesting, and eventually the thing that you're putting out uh, is a combination of all of these things. So let me now talk about where we're at in the piece. You can see here that I've flatted everything, although if you know what the final image looks like, you'll know that these colors aren't exactly the way that it ends up. This is what I'm slowly referring to as my let's get started flats, which is like, I'm tired of flatting. Flatting can be really boring. Let's just get into doing the painting part, the sort of exciting part. By the way, you can even hear in the way that I usually refer to the flats. I mean, the flatting process is largely a comic book term. It's used everywhere, but like that comes from comic books largely, at least as far as I know. That's sort of where I was first hearing it and using it. And so um, there's some influence right there in my process. But anyways, uh, so now we've got flats that are enough of the big shapes that we can start the rendering but the problem is we will have to go in later to make sure that everything is the way we like it. Luckily, we are using the method here where we've got adjustment layers on top, or not adjustment layers, but layers with blend modes on top so that we can always adjust those flats underneath pretty easily. So right now I'm doing my ambient occlusion pass and you can see I am moving through the layers like I normally do. Uh, if this is your first video that you've ever watched of mine, uh, the method that I'm using here is linked down below. It's called Select Paint, Select Clear. And yes, there will be a new version of those videos soon with the new interface with uh, when Procreate 5 comes out. So look forward to that. So for now, I'm not going to go through that process again because I know some of you are tired of hearing it. Um, but go ahead and check out that video if you're new to this. Um, the This is a process that I use all the time because it's orderly and it's a major way for me to get around Procreate layer limits. So uh, it just works out quite well. So now you can see with the layers we've got, we're, we've done like her body skin, we've done her, the little like sort of fleshy thickness of her skin on her body. We've done the spine, and we are, I mean, there's other things we've done too. I shouldn't go through every one of them, but we're basically just moving through those layers. So what did I do with Max's design that feels like it's me and doing it in my style? I think there's a number of things without getting too granular. Uh, the anatomy that I use here is, I think, pretty indicative of how I usually build anatomy on a female human head. Uh, I think some of the things that I interpret, like eye shapes and nose shapes, are definitely more me than what Max had done. Uh, and then when we get to sort of the final, you can see that I kept the palette thematically the same. Wait, thematically and functionally the same? I can't tell which, I don't know what the right word is, but let's just say that if you were going to describe this woman, you would describe her maybe as like a Caucasian zombie with... Or greeny blue, greenish blue hair and a yellow uh, skull earring, something like that. And I think that you could say the exact same thing about my character and Max's character. But now the actual type of skin tone and the type of blue for the hair and all of those things is certainly different. So again, the point of the draw it in your style, I think that the, the cool thing about that hashtag is you could do this in several different ways and, and still call it your style. Um, but the way that I wanted to go with it was basically with shapes and color. That was the main thing. You could also, there are people that do like really cool stuff where they're like really known for crazy dynamic poses. So instead they draw her doing that, emphasizing that. 
Um, and I just think that it's a really cool hashtag for those reasons. I think that one of my favorite things to do, which if you go through, especially my historical work, like if you go through like DeviantArt and you go really far back and stuff, one of my favorite things to do is to draw popular characters very differently. Um, a lot of people also, here's another topic people like to talk about, like should you have fan art or should you not have fan art in your portfolio? I think that um, this is kind of one of those questions that people really love to try and get like a binary answer out of. And you're going to get people that are going to say like, do never do that. That's the dumbest thing you could do. And then you'll have other people that are like, yeah, fuck it. It's popular. Like they'll, they'll use the popularity argument or something like that. Maybe they have a better argument than that. Hopefully they have a better argument than that. But I think popularity is certainly used. Um, for me, I think that drawing fan art is really about why you're drawing fan art when it's in regards to trying to get a job in the industry or to get continual work in the industry. If you are straight up drawing the characters for like in an illustration because you want to sell that print at like a Comic Con or something like that, which is of course fine. Like if you want to do that, that's fine. Artistically, that's fine. Um, that doesn't really get you the work that most of the time that uh, another reason, let's say, to do the fan art would get you work. So what, in my opinion, are the ways that fan art can get you work and have like a valid reason? I think that if you are wildly reinterpreting a character, I think that that's valuable. I think it shows that you have range, the ability to see things differently. Um, you can work in different styles. You can look at one thing and translate it to something else. So like for instance, put yourself in the shoes of your concept art team and you're trying to find the vibe of a game. If one artist on the team draws a character a certain way and then you're the guy who takes that perfectly fine character design but you reinterpret it using let's say wild shapes or something like that then that could end up being the version that you end up going with because it's got a little something to it and i think that the difference between drawing fan art and drawing another concept artist on your team's work a different way I think there's no difference there and it's the same set of skills it's about trying to figure out what makes that character work and what are the hallmarks and then reinterpreting the things that don't have to stay constant and I think that that's a hugely valuable uh, skill so the other reason to do fan art I think is if you are trying to show how well you can replicate a look and feel so for instance if you have a portfolio that has the Scooby-Doo cast perfectly redrawn and then the next page has the Simpsons cast perfectly redrawn and then the next page, page has the Incredibles cast perfectly re represented the way they look kind, kind of thing. Uh, this is a crude example, but let's just say that's pretty valuable to an animation studio or some other studio where they have to replicate the look of something. And that's, that's hugely valuable. I would argue that people would probably not necessarily call that fan art because I think fan art is usually a derogatory term used for when people are just drawing shit they like because they want other people who like it to engage with it on social media and that's not really necessarily what fan art is or I, I guess I guess more importantly I shouldn't say that's not what fan art is I, I should say that there are other things that get lumped into that category that are actually perfectly valuable um, things that you do in the industry and you should have skill sets to do in the industry uh, so I think that, so to, to summarize all of that, fan art, or, or more specifically put, drawing characters that aren't your own, that are popular characters, is not bad. The point is, is that you have to figure out why you're doing it, and you have to see if that demonstrates something that is valuable to somebody who would want to work with you. I hope that cleared that up. I think a really practical way to sort of say this is if I'm looking through your portfolio and I see that you did a bunch of one-off illustrations of a bunch of different IPs that aren't your own and the illustrations are just cool illustrations, then to me that's what they are. They're just cool illustrations. Now, if you showed me those same illustrations and you had completely redefined kind of what that world could be from a visual perspective, then I'm like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Similarly, if you draw all the characters from a thing and they're in like, let's say turns or something like that, then that demonstrates like, oh, this person can interpret, can figure out what makes this style and 
can replicate it. And then I go, cool, that's, that might be something that I'm looking for too. But as I, I think I've said before, that there's three things that need to happen for you to get a job with anyone. That is the person, the first thing is that person or entity needs to, they have to have a need. Then the second one is they have to know about you. And then the third one is you have to be good enough for the job. So if you, if you think of it that way, there's a company out there. The first thing that they need is they, or the first thing that you need, I should say, is you need them to need something that you do. So if it's like an animation studio and they're looking for a background artist, um, then they open up a role. So that's step one. That's something that you can apply for. If you apply to a company and even if you're really good and they don't need anything that you do, they won't hire you um, unless it's one of those talent hunt things where they're like, we just want talented people in the building, which of course happens, um, but that's super, super rare, I would say unless they have a directive, which is the same as a need, to say, we just want talented people in the building. Okay, fine. But if budgets being what they are, and needs being what they are, and overhead being what it is, they can say, that it could, most of the time a company will say like, well, no, you're very talented, but we don't need that role right now. So the reason why I'm mentioning those three things is because that very, very, very first one is they have to have a need, and that need could be we need somebody who repl replicates looks and feels. We need somebody who can reinterpret existing things. We need somebody who does something totally brand new. Like these are all various needs and so fan art can fill into one of those needs. Now let's talk about this piece since it's caught up quite a bit. Um, so we've adjusted some of the colors in here to be uh, a little bit richer. You can see I've got the lines turned on again because I was I needed them to reference the exact uh, shape of something there. Uh, we have applied the eight, the flats are done, although they'll get a little bit more tweaks as it goes on. We've got the uh, ambient occlusion pass and now we've got the direct shadow. It's, it's kind of, it's not exactly the core shadow, but it sort of becomes the core shadow because once some of the bounce lights get put in, uh, it can kind of become the core shadow. But that's, that's essentially, as I've said before, it's like the direct light shadow. That's what we're doing right here. So now that we're on her face, and you can tell we're on her face because the hair, the, the sort of drop shadow from the hair just landed there. Um, and then we are probably about to see the hair shadows get cleared, that like top layer of hair, and then those, those drop shadows will be painted in there next. Okay, so there we go, the hair just got... The, the shadows on the hair just got cleared, the messy part, and now we're going to go in and actually put in the shadows. So um, I want to take a minute to also say that I thought Max's design on this was super cool. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, like it looked really cool. That's why I wanted to jump in on it. Um, so this was just really fun to do in general. I thought the palette was cool. And uh, I just love playing with shapes and playing with other people's designs. I, if I could get a job where all I did was every day took somebody's drawing and like redrew it, I, that probably be kind of like a dream job to some degree. Um, I'd probably get frustrated with it eventually because I, I usually get bored of everything eventually, but um, that, that would be pretty fun to do for a while at least. I should also state that I'm recording this video in Malta. I'm here for THU. I'm not going to do like a big banner on this one and say, hey, everyone, I'm a THU uh, because I did that quite a bit already. And, and if you're not at THU, then you're not going to get there anytime soon. Um, I hope to come again in the future and I hope to go to other events in the future as well. So uh, I'll try to make sure that I'm really clear uh, like I was this time when I'm going to be at some place so that we can meet up. So today is technically the first day. I'll be doing portfolio reviews for the company that I work for, uh, King, and um, I'll be doing that tomorrow as well. And then the sort of event kicks off in earnest, and I hope to see people around. 
Oh, I just real I just revealed that I said today and tomorrow. I'm gonna drop this video tomorrow. I usually try to release the videos on Tuesdays and Fridays, but I'm recording this on Monday just to make sure that I, because I had some free time, I might as well get it done right now, kind of thing. Okay, so we've applied the lighting, or we're in the middle of applying the lighting. It's sort of this muted blue. I thought that that would work really nicely with the skin and sort of keeping it a little bit stronger than I normally do can kind of bring some of that, that like undead vibe to her. Um, she's got a pretty crazy design. I mean, we don't really know if she's undead. Maybe she's supposed to look like this. She has missing skin bits, but he kept it pretty uh, designy. So uh, maybe this is just the way she is. Maybe she's just born this way. Maybe she's a, a, a god of something or a specter or maybe she's some sort of a creature that has an exposed face or maybe she's a zombie. I don't know. She could be undead. Max never really told us and frankly, I feel like his lore building on this was pretty weak. That was a joke, by the way. I've said it before, but that splotch to the right, that's something I used to do in Photoshop all the time and I've done less and less with Procreate, but I wanted to do it here so that I could handle quick edits quickly because when you adjust the ambient occlusion shadow, it's kind of hard to get the true color back. So I put this big blotch down there so that as I adjust layers, I can always just switch it back to normal and I can sample from that big fat blob right there. So that'll get cleared eventually. We're putting the shines in the hair. Uh, something I've been doing a lot lately is I'll do sort of two passes on the hair shine. It's sort of that fatter, lower opacity shine, and then one that's a little bit more um, precise and brighter. Uh, you can see we added some of the gradients into the hair because Max had some cool color play in the hair. And now I want to go in and start adding some additional details and, and some opportunities to maybe make it a little bit more my own. So we're going in and we're coloring the teeth, putting one gold tooth in because that's fun. And then soon we're going to be getting into like a bounce lighting pass where I'm going to be going through and making sure that that's all captured properly. So we're starting right now with that eye, making sure that the glossiness of the eye is in there. We get the bounce on the upper lip, putting some bounce like in the, the fleshy depth bits right there. And soon you're going to start seeing that like with the skin and the bone being of similar value, uh, I want to start separating those a bit. So we're going to see some adjustments coming in that are going to try and address that. Uh, right now we're doing a little bit of that that high saturation halo that's all around the shadow, the cast shadow. So you can see there the, the skeleton just got a lot more saturated and a lot brighter and that's to try and separate it from the skin as much as possible. I wanted to add a little bit of like a shaved part um, to the hair right there so that's me going in and just making that in there which is I'm just using a dark blue and then uh, gonna lower the opacity on that. One thing that's funny in this is I did bring a little bit of like a blotchy skin pattern thing and then when I was in the middle of doing it I screwed up the clearing of that, like the, the cleanup of it, let's say. And so uh, it's there and I actually posted it that way and then I realized it after the fact and so in this version we're going to see that come in where I'm going to at the last second come in and clean that up. So I opt to add some of these sort of like freckly splotchy bits um, all across her. I just thought it was kind of cool to add like a little bit of pattern to her um, and uh, bring in something that's just a little bit different than in the original. And now we're putting a uh, rim light on the right side to try and bring out some of the definition over there.
a second, you're going to see some darkening happening on the distant side of the face, uh, bringing some of this sh shadowing in so that we can create some more depth and highlight some areas of the face. See how splotchy it is around the hole where you see her, uh, her vertebrae? Uh, that is what I'm talking about. And I completely posted it with that intact. And then after the fact, I was like, oh, shit. I think if anybody caught it, they probably just thought it was like weird aspects of her skin or something because she's obviously not completely normal. Um, but I was like, oh, shit. So it will get cleared. Um, right now, I'm just filling in the background. I wanted to keep the texture that I'd been putting in recent paintings, but I wanted to have it be the same color basically of Max's piece. So by doing that, I just took the, I sampled it, not from his piece, but I sampled what I had in the background. And then I dropped the darkness of the canvas a little bit. And then on a, a new layer, just painted it back in. And then we add some uh, outlines here, doing uh, like this orangey, yellowy orange on one side and then like a pink on the other side. Uh, fleshy pink though, not, not, too, not too saturated or anything. It starts as yellow, but then the intention is to color shift it once it's all done. Like that, right there. Now we're in the sort of little tweaky phase. I'm just going through making sure certain things read as clear as they can be. There was like a little hard shoulder line put in there and some extra definition where the cheek gets cut down into the bone right there just to separate things a little more and create some extra contrast. Uh, you can see that I smoothed out the background a little bit more because it was just a bit too noisy and added some extra definition on the shoulder right there at the end. Um, so this is all wrapping up and in a second all of those colors and shadows will be final. There we go, there's my cleanup fixing that problem. I just ended up doing it as a paint over too just to get it wrapped up. And this right here is the final piece. So let's take a look also at Max's again, just so we can see the difference. So again, in general, the same character, but interpreted with very, very different shapes and colors. So as usual, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed all of the ranting about fan art and getting a job and developing a style and all that kind of stuff. And I hope you enjoyed watching this piece come together. Thanks a lot to Max for doing the original. It was really fun to work on. And if you're looking for me on the internet, these are the places where you can find me.